Hey everybody, thank you for coming to my talk, Bayesian Estimation of Macroeconomic Models in Julia. My name is Aidan Gleick. I am a Senior Research Analyst at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. A quick disclaimer before I begin, the views expressed in this talk are my own and they do not necessarily reflect those of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York or the Federal Reserve System. In this talk, I'm going to begin by discussing the general models that I use at the New York Fed. I'm then going to discuss how we estimate those models before moving into some of the challenges we're currently facing in the estimation of those models. At the New York Fed, I work on macroeconomic models. Macro models in general are designed to model the economy as a whole, focusing on variables such as gross domestic product, interest rates, and prices. I specifically work on dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, or DSGE models, which are a class of large scale macro models. These are one of the many tools used by central banks to inform policy decisions. One way that these models inform policy is through forecasts. So here I provided a forecast of the real federal funds rate as well as the real natural rate. And this forecast is coming from the DSGE model forecast, which is publicly available online. The DSGE team is the team that I work on at the New York Fed. Now, those of you who are not macroeconomists may not be familiar with the real natural rate or R star. R star is the interest rate that would prevail in an economy without sticky wages or prices. Now, that means that R star is a hypothetical concept. It's not something that we can actually observe. However, using DSGE models or macro models, we are able to provide estimates of historical values as well as forecasts of future values. We also forecast more familiar variables such as GDP growth. And here, our June forecast is a bit pessimistic. And we can also see a table of forecasts um, from 2022 through 2025 of the common variables, GDP growth, core PCE inflation, and the real natural rate of interest. Now, how do we create these forecasts? Well, we first have to have a model, um, and a DSGE model is a state-space model. So I've defined what a state-space model is. It com is comprised of two equations, a transition equation and a measurement equation. The transition equation defines the dynamics of the states of the model, S of T. And the way that the model or the states connect to the variables, observed variables, is through the measurement equation. So we see here that the states depend on previous states, and of course the parameters, and the observed variables are a function of the states. Now, those equations were functions of the parameters. So, of course, to use this model in the real world, we need a way of estimating the parameters. On the DSGE team, we use Bayesian methodology, which means that we are going to conduct inference about the parameters through the posterior distribution. That is the distribution of the parameter vector theta conditional on observed data y. We're going to use the prior distribution, which summarizes our prior beliefs about the parameter vector theta, as well as the likelihood function, which connects the model to the data. Um, and that likelihood function is using the measurement equation from the previous um, slides, among other things. And you can see here that I've written the posterior distribution as a function of or as proportional to the prior times the likelihood. If we wanted to get equality there, of course, using Bayes' rule, we would need to divide by the marginal distribution of the data. But the marginal distribution of the data is impossible analytically to calculate, or at least it's very, very hard. So we use proportionality and then an estimation algorithm such as sequential Monte Carlo to estimate the posterior distribution. So on the DSGE team at the Fed, we primarily use 
SMC as our estimation algorithm. SMC is an algorithm that combines important sampling and Metropolis Hastings to estimate the posterior distribution. A couple benefits of using SMC is that it is very easy to parallelize and it also, it does not require linearity. Now, the state space model that I showed you before was linear, but some DSG models, many DSG models, are not linear, and we're still able to use SMC for those models. Specifically, we're using a sequential Monte Carlo sampler from Herbst and Trifida, a 2014 paper by Herbst and Trifida, and we've implemented that algorithm in our package smc.jl. And you can see here using our package dsge.jl and then smc.jl, you are able to initialize and then estimate a DSGE model using only a few lines of code. A couple comments or some descriptions about our SMC implementation. We are using a tempered likelihood function as the proposal, proposal distribution for SMC. And what this means is that we are going to temper in the likelihood function into the posterior distribution um, to use as a proposal distribution. So when that phi of n terms equals zero, we are just using the prior as the proposal distribution. But then we will slowly increase phi of n um, towards one so that at the end of our tempering schedule, we will be using the posterior distribution as a proposal distribution. Now this is important because SMC, like many Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, um, is sensitive to the proposal distribution. And this tempering schedule is one way to make sure that your proposal distribution works well in the algorithm. We use an adaptive tempering schedule um, to even further increase efficiency in our algorithm. And that adaptive um, at that adaptive schedule is based on the variance of the particles. We also use an adaptive Metropolis Hastings algorithm within SMC. And this adaptive MH algorithm has an adaptive proposal distribution. I'm going to talk more about this MH algorithm in the next few slides. And additionally, we do these estimations online to increase efficiency, and I'll speak about what that means after I've discussed the adaptive MH algorithm. So this algorithm is also given um, within that Herbst and Trifida paper. It, include, it includes an adaptive scaling of the proposal covariance matrix, as well as a mixture proposal distribution. That mixture distribution is using a combination of three normals, the first has a mean of the current state and a variance of the adaptive scaling factor times sigma. The second has a mean of the current state and a variance of that adaptive scaling factor times the diagonal of sigma. And the third has a normal um, with a mean of the sample mean of the previous state and then a variance of the scaling factor times sigma. So what is that adaptive scaling factor? Well, to compute it, you first compute the empirical rejection rate, and then you plug that empirical rejection rate into this function f, and you're plugging one minus the rejection rate, which means you're, you're giving it the empirical acceptance rate. And what is that function f doing? Well, if your rejection rate or your acceptance rate is greater than the target of 0.25, then that fraction um, multiplying that 0 0.1 is going to be very close to 1, which means that f of x is going to output about 1.05, so it's going to be increasing the scaling factor. So c hat of n is going to be greater than c hat of n minus 1. But, um, alternatively, if your empirical acceptance rate is below 0 0.25, then that fraction multiplying 0 0.1 is going to be very close to 0, which means that f of x will be very close to 0 0.95, which means that you will be shrinking your scaling factor. c hat of n will be less than c hat of n minus 1. The idea being that if you're below your target acceptance rate, you want to decrease sigma. And if you are above your acceptance rate, you want to increase sigma.
Now, in order to test this algorithm, um, we implemented it in Julia, um, and we ran 200 estimations of the standard MH compared to the herb Trifida MH. Now, 400 estimations of a DSGE model is quite a significant task, but using Julia's speed and its ease of parallelization, we were able to run these, twist, these tests quite efficiently. To show you the results, I've plotted the marginal data densities of the herbs and trifida results in red and the MDDs of the standard MH in black. And you can see that the mode of the herbs and trifida MDDs is actually higher or better than that of the standard MH. But you have this long left tail in the herbs and trifida results that you don't have in the standard MH results. So what's going on there? Well, when I investigated those estimations in the left tail, um, they showed that they had scaling factors that had gone to zero, which implies that the particle had gotten stuck at a local min, and the resulting low acceptance rate had caused the algorithm to reduce the scaling factor to zero. So the algorithm saw that we had a lower acceptance rate than the target, and if it thought that was because sigma was too large, when in reality, we were stuck at a local min and probably actually wanted a larger sigma um, in order to get out of that min. So the algorithm got confused and it caused the particle to get stuck. But the mode of the adaptive MDDs is actually better than the mode of the standard MDDs. And this is what makes the herb Trifida algorithm attractive for use within SMC. Because although those results show a long left tail, because of the selection step in SMC, SMC is just going to kill those particles that have those sort of outliers that might get stuck, and it will keep using the sort of mode particles, which have higher MDDs than you may have gotten out of the standard MH algorithm. So even though you have that long left tail, this algorithm works great within SMC. To go back to online estimation, the motivation for online estimation is that we would like to estimate our model frequently. However, estimating DSGE models takes quite a bit of time, especially if you are estimating over the entire data set. By estimating online, what we mean is that we're going to use our previous estimation up to time t um, as the prior of our estimation using data up to time t plus 1. So we don't have to completely redo the estimation over the entire time period. We only have to do the estimation over a much, much smaller time period. And of course, it doesn't have to be t and t plus 1. It could be t and t plus 5 or t and t plus 10. Um, but the point is that we are using a previous estimation um, in the prior of a current estimation to increase efficiency. Now, a problem we've been having is that our online estimation methods have begin have started to give poor results when using COVID data, um, forcing us to estimate since 2019. So we use an estimation up to 2019, and then we estimate from 2019 onward. This is due in part um, because of the data that was produced during COVID. Um, if you know, anyone, anybody who pays attention to macroeconomic data would know that COVID produced quite exceptional values during that time. Um, the data itself is a problem, as well as the model changes that we had to incorporate um, in order to effectively model that data have also um, caused problems. And I'm going to walk through some of those model changes that we've made now. So one of the first things that we did was institute parameter regime switching. What this means is that effectively we have time varying parameters. Some of our parameters may be set to zero during certain time periods um, and then have be sort of turned on um, during other time periods. For example, we have COVID shocks, um, which are only active during phase one and phase two of the pandemic. So that would be 2020 Q1 through 2020 Q4. Otherwise, they're sort of nulled out or set to zero. Additionally, we have model regimes um, now, this means that we actually change the dynamics of the model itself, the equations, not just the parameters, 
Uh, for example, um, we have policy regimes to account for the switch from flexible inflation targeting to average inflation targeting. These changes have led to unresolved issues surrounding the estimation of the model, including the issues um, with online estimation that I spoke about before. Some current challenges um, and open questions that we're facing right now. We would like to be able to use estimation methods such as Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, but um, during the previous summer, uh, when we attempted to implement HMC, we found that the gradient calculation of the likelihood function was so slow that it made HMC effectively infeasible. However, we want to be using the sort of state-of-the-art estimation algorithm, such as the no-U-turn sampler, um, which requires that gradient calculation. We would like to find ways to speed that up so we have access to those algorithms. Additionally, when talking about parameter regimes and model regimes, uh, you may have noticed that if we're using a parameter only during four quarters, that means we only have four quarters of data potentially to estimate that parameter, which in macro is not very much. That raises the question of how should we go about estimating those parameters if we have such limited data? For example, should we make them a function of previously estimated parameters, which then allows us to use more data um, to more effectively estimate those parameters? But if we're gonna use a function of previous parameters, what exactly would that function be? Some of the approaches we're taking at the moment, um, we are trying multiple different ways of estimating COVID parameters, such as using scaled versions of parameters from previous periods. We are experimenting with our online estimation methods. I ran a whole suite of estimations, thousands of estimations, um, testing different setups for online estimation. So going from 2019, halfway through COVID, stopping, then continuing onward, um, going up through COVID, stopping halfway, continuing on, um, so on and so forth, to try to figure out where exactly our online estimation methods are going wrong um, to see if we can better pinpoint the cause so that we don't have to be estimating from 2019 onwards each time. We're also researching more adaptive MH methods for use both within sequential Monte Carlo as well as self-contained estimation methods. In conclusion, DSGE models are slow to estimate. Improving estimation times and accuracy can allow for more complicated models to be used and allow for more eff efficient workflow, which is especially important when conducting policy analysis. COVID, um, both the data and the model changes were have exacerbated the difficulties surrounding estimation which has motivated more research into estimation methods. Adaptive algorithms we have found can improve estimation time, but they can also fail in ways that standard algorithms do not. And throughout this entire research process, Julia's speed and ease of use has allowed us to quickly implement, test, and improve our estimation algorithms. Thank you all for coming to my talk. And please reach out to me at aiden.glike at ny.frb.org with any questions or comments you may have. Thank you.